Bishop Hammond, welcome back to the show. Oh, it's good to be here. Good to be with you today. So now, I, I was... <laughs> catch me at home. It's, it's, I'm actually I'm home for this week. I've been traveling heavy all year, but thank God I'm here now. Well, I'm, I'm glad we could fit this in during your busy holiday schedule. And I was looking back, it's been almost two years since our last interview. So I thought we'd start uh, kind of the same place we started last time. And uh, that's with a bit of the Bill Hammond origin story. So I know you're going to be new to some of the people watching, some of the people listening. So if you had to give us the elevator pitch version of the Bill Hammond origin story, what are a few things that all the listeners, all the viewers should know about you? Well, you know, um, I'm just an Oklahoma boy that uh, God saved when I was age 16. Came down to, a lady came from Oklahoma City all the way down to, we lived just five miles from Red River in an area where there was no electricity until I was 16. So we plowed with mules and horses and grew water out of the well. It was real rustic, real country. And But I got saved, filled with the Holy Ghost. And then three years later, I was living in Amarillo, Texas, and uh, God led me to attend the church where they were worshiping God and, and singing praises and prophesying. And the Lord released a prophetic flow through me. And then a prophet prophesied to me. Then a year later, I was in Bible College in Portland, Oregon, drove my 1948 Studebaker all the way out there, 1,300 miles by myself. And uh, from the Bible College, they gave me prophetic prosperity there and prophesied everything that a prophet does, but they just didn't have the faith in those days to call you a five-fold minister. But uh, from there, then a few years later, the, a couple came out and prophesied, God said, I've called you a prophet to the nations. And <clears throat> so I ended up pastoring six years at a church in Tottenham, Washington, Yakima Valley. And then I traveled evangelistic work for three years and then taught in a Bible college in San Antonio, Texas for uh, five years and then started building Christian International undergraduate and graduate. Bible College Extension Program. <clears throat> we uh, got an undergraduate graduate. I ended up enrolling about 9,000 students all over the world and had a lot of graduates. And uh, But then we moved from uh, for San Antonio to Phoenix, Arizona for seven years, between 77 and 82. And there I started the School of the Holy Spirit, training people to hear the voice of God and prophesying to people. And and then in 1984, we moved to where we are right now in Santa Rosa Beach, Florida, which is in the Panhandle of Florida, halfway between Panama City and Fort Walton, the Destin area and Seaside. And uh, we started training people uh, in the man, wrote a manual for ministry and spiritual gifts. And we've trained over half a million people over the last 30 years. I personally prophesied to over 50,000 individuals from presidents of nations to babes in arms. And um, you know, I had a lady come up to me the other day and says, I'm 47 years old and I'm in this world because of you. And I said, oh, how's that? <laughs> she said, well, 48 years ago, you came to our church up in Pennsylvania and you prophesied to my mom that she was going to have a baby girl, but she had cancer of the uterus, endometriosis, and two of the other things. The doctor said it was impossible for her to have a baby. But nine months later, she had that baby and there was this she says, I'm 47, and that was 48 years ago, and I'm in this world today because you spoke a healing deliverance to my mom and she was able to help me. <laughs> so it's exciting. But I'm glad it was prophetic, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, then we've, we've, been, we've been traveling the world and writing books, and most of my books are on the, um, on the uh, restoration movement. When, the, when I was 19... Um, <clears throat> In 1978, God spoke to me to write a book, and finally somebody called and said, God told me to help you do some research and write a book on, on the church. And I said, okay, it'll be in the church. So I wrote the book on the eternal church. That's the one that's, uh, it covers all the restoration movements. Imagine you read this, and it's an almost 400-page book, but it covers the origination of the church, the deterioration of the church, the restoration of the church, and the destiny of the church. And when that came out, I taught and preached on that, but it, it covers every restoration movements from the, the second reformation. I talked to people about we're in the third reformation. I said the first reformation was the birth of the church, establish it, spread it to the ends of the earth. The way church went through a thousand year dark age from 500 AD to 1500 AD. And then God started the restoration of the church. And we call that the second reformation. And we had nine restoration. We had nine restoration movements during those 500 years. We had the evangelical and 
and, and I mean, had the historic Protestant in 1500, Evangelical 1600, Holy 1700, Divine Healing 1800, Pentecostal 1900, Restoration 1948, and then we had the uh, Charismatic Renewal, then we had the uh, Faith Movement, and then I had the privilege of pioneering and prophesying and bringing in the Prophetic Movement in 1988, it was birthed. Then 1998, we had the Apostolic Birth of one of our conferences, and then I knew when all five is restored, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, that then we could do what God called us to do is equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And so we, um, I wrote the book on the day of the saints, which is tells us that the, that uh, God's had a saints movement. And that happened in 2007. Um, like Cindy Jacobs was here, Chuck Pierce and Dutch Sheets, and, and uh, Lou Ingalls was all there to meet and they all witnessed that the saints movement had been birthed and but i wasn't fully satisfied i still something yet you know you ever had that feeling like god there's something more something more well, i should have recognized it because i was pregnant with this prophetic movement for about 10 years for birth and uh and i was pregnant with what god was going to do and he surprised me he said in 2008 uh spring he spoke to me from heaven and said the third and final church reformation is now decreed for planet earth on the church. And so that was the beginning of the third reformation. And in the first move of God in the third reformation is the army of the Lord. And I've been traveling the world. Uh, I wrote the book on God's World War Three, And then when Chosen published it, they called it God's Weapons of War. And this gives you all the means and ways of doing corporate warfare. I've done corporate warfare in 30 nations of the world. And I lead them into uh, bring transformation to the nation and tear down strongholds and establish the kingdom of God. And um, so that's but then, you know, most of our books is uh, on, on these movements. But uh, then the Lord challenged me. I, I started a mentoring day. I would mentor how people come in from uh, for Friday noon to Saturday noon. I'd mentor them on God's highest calling. And, um, and it so transformed lives and blessed people so much. I thought, well, maybe I should write a book on it so it could cover more people. So this is a book I wrote that they just came out with called Your Highest Calling. And uh, I bring out that your highest, greatest calling is not the greatest apostle. You know, I'm an apostle of, of 5,000 churches around the world. And uh, I've, I've seen miracles, signs, and wonders. And uh, we've been trained over 500 people in the prophetic. And I've been a prophet, prophesying, ministry. I, I, I did the work of them. But if I could be the greatest of all, I still wouldn't have made my highest calling. You could be an evangelist winning thousands every week in great stadiums. You could be a pastor of 100,000, or you could be a teacher that's teaching in the most prestigious universities and be maybe the millionaire, billionaire, giving the most to the church and blessing. But that's not our highest calling. That is, that's the works God wants us to do on earth. But our highest calling is being conformed to the likeness and character of Jesus Christ. Because in the beginning, God made man. And what he told you, he says, man, I made you in my image and likeness. I want you and I'm going to give you power to reproduce creatures just like yourself. And that will and that'll come out your image. So I want you to fill the earth with a race of God-like creation that's in the image and likeness of God. And thinks like God, acts like God, talks like God, has God's convictions, God's vision, whole works. But Adam failed. I failed and, and he sinned and got kicked out of the garden, lost the image of God. And so 4,000 years later, God sent his son, Jesus Christ, and he came to start a new race. And then we became the church race, which is new creation in Christ Jesus. And when he says we're a new creation in Christ Jesus, that means we're as much a new creation as Adam was a new creation in the garden. We're a new creation in Christ Jesus. And we're a whole brand new race among the human race. And I tell people, as a born again Christian, you're different than the rest of humanity. And they say, well, how's that? I said, you've got eternal life in a mortal body. And, but the others have eternal death in a mortal body. And if they're never born again, they, they suffer the second death, which is a lake of fire. And I said, we're God's special people. But God saved us, not just to have a good big family to love on and just be sweet people to be with him. He saved the church for a purpose, to accomplish a purpose for him. Many things we got to accomplish on planet Earth. But evangelicals and Pentecostal theologians and, 
and they, and their eschatology see no purpose for the church except to win more to the church. But God raised up the church as the body of Christ. When God sent his son Jesus, Jesus was the body of God on earth. And the Bible said the fullness of the Godhead dwelled in the body of Jesus. So everything God did on earth, he did it through and with his son to his body on earth. Now that body was crucified, resurrected, sent it back to heaven, sat down at the right hand of the Father. And Jesus said, Father, I finished the work you gave me to do. And Father said, yes, you have now sit at my right hand to make all image of which to you burst the church. The church is your body now. And another name for the church is the body of Christ. And we are the body of the of God upon earth, the church of Christ. And the, Jesus had about 15 or 20 things he had to fulfill while he was on earth in that mortal body. And the church has several things we must fulfill before Jesus can come again. Can I... Can I, can I back us up for just a moment, Bill? Um, th thanks for giving us a, a great flyover of, of your life and your ministry. Um, you've, you've got that whole stack of books there on the table. And in the opening part of this book, you talk about that, your highest calling, you describe it as the most important book you've ever written. Um, I've heard a number of people say that they feel like for you, this is a legacy book. Um, how does this stand out or what, what's unique or different about this book compared to uh, all of your earlier books? Well, most of my books have to deal with the move of God. Uh, the, the first book, The Eternal Church, covers the whole restoration movement of the church, 2,000 years of the church. And then the, the trilogy on the prophetic covers the prophetic movement. And then prophets, apostles, prophets, and coming moves of God, that covers the, these, these, these three here. These, they cover the, the, the prophetic. You know, and then I knew when that was done, we, the apostles would be here, so I did one on the apostles, and that was done. I knew the saints would come and get one of the saints. Then I finally got caught up, and I could do one. I started in 1964 on eight reasons God created the human race called Who Am I? Why Am I Here? And then the Lord spoke to me about the third Reformation beginning, so I wrote the book, and they, and they, and they called it Prophetic Scripture to be fulfilled. And then I wrote the book, Kept fulfilling called 70 reasons for speaking in tongues. And there really are 70 reasons, they're numbered. And they're real. And then I wrote the book on how can these things be subtitled A Preacher and a Miracle Worker but Denied Heaven. Dealt really with what's really sin, what can we do, and dealt with all the false doctrines that's floating around in the church world today. But then I started doing this mentoring day and I, 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 people thought it was, it was so serious or all of these deal with either restoration movement or general subject. This deals with the person because the truths in this makes a difference of your eternity. And I talk about the individual, like uh, kind of the publisher said that they like this book because it sounds like I'm not preaching or teaching, I'm just sharing with the people. And so this really, like it says, you can gain the whole world and lose your own soul. You know, you can, and you can be the greatest minister world. First Corinthians 13, why, you know, it says, yeah, I can, you can become the greatest prophetic, I understand all ministry, you can become great apostolic, work miracles, you become a faith person, move mountains, you can become a humanitarian and give your body to be burned. And one translation says, even if I gave my body to be sacrificed and murdered on the cross and burned, yet if I didn't have love, it profits me nothing. Now, the, first John says, God is love. God doesn't have love. God is love and love is God. So whatever God is, Jesus is. So Jesus is love. So what you can say there, if you don't have Christ likeness, love doesn't convey a lot to people. I mean, love, you know, they, they don't know. But but love is Christ likeness. That's the reason it says in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, follow after love, Christ likeness, and desire to manifest spiritual gifts. And so here we find that you can, you can manifest all these gifts, you can do all these great things, you can have the greatest ministry in the world, but if you don't have Christ-like character, it promises you nothing. So this is the very important thing, and that's the thing God started dealing with me about, and, and most people know Romans 8, 28, 29, where Paul said, and when Paul says this, you know, Paul's life, he went through a lot of, more suffering than anybody else, and it says, but I know that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So if you love God and you're called according to your purpose, what's all things got to do? 
work together for your good. What is that good? The good is Christ's likeness. God, you know, people read, quote that scripture, oh, God's worked to my good, I'm more popular, I'll everything will be much better. That's not necessarily so. In the long run, yes, but you may go through a Job experience to get there. And so I bring out to show that God's highest calling is being conformed to the nature and character of Jesus Christ. And most people know that, but what they don't know is the process. So I deal with the law of transformation and the process for conformity. And there's everybody that's destined to be like Christ is going to go through some heartbreaking, mind-blowing, world-shaking situations where you say, why I mean, God, why did this happen? And I tell people, once you understand the principles and truths of this book, you'll never ask why again about your life situation because you'll understand why. Because God is perfecting you and moving in you. So I, I, and people say, well, yeah, but it's God's will that I'll be in health and prosper and, and everything goes smooth. How can that be? And yet God use it. How, how can God use something that's contrary to his will? I said, well, it's like this. When I travel overseas, I go on a plane and I get on that plane and there is a law of gravity that says anything heavier than air has to come down. But I get on that plane that's got tons of people and luggage and plane and and, and it, it, there's a law of aerodynamics of thrust and lift. And I get on that plane, it goes up, it travels 15 hours till I get to Korea, and then it comes down and lands. And people ask me, how was your flight? I said, it went up, stayed up, came down right, good flight. <laughs> but the fact of it is, that law of aerodynamics does not destroy the law of gravity. It supersedes it to accomplish a faster, higher purpose. So I, I, I use this illustration. Uh, the thumb is your inner man. Though the outward man perish, yet the inward man, the, the Christ of good woman, is renewed and transformed day by day. You take these four fingers and make it everything in your natural life, he, your, your physical, financial, social, family, uh, every place. And God will sacrifice. These are the will of God. Uh, throughout Deuteronomy, says, if you obey God's voice, keep his commandments, he'll bless you for Financially, family, I mean, everything you touch is blessed. And so, word of God is, it's your will that you be happy, be fulfilled, be prosperous, but there's a higher will. And that will is conformity to the likeness of Christ. God will sacrifice any of these four, and sometimes all four at the same time, to produce the character of Christ within us. And, and um, so, but it, it's like the aerodynamics. Aerodynamics supersedes the law of gravity. The law of conformity to the image of Christ supersedes the law of blessing, of prosperity, and all this for a moment, for a prior time, to, com to convert and transform the inner person to the likeness of Christ. And I tell people, no one understands the truth. I don't have an enemy in the world. They say, you don't have an enemy in the world? I say, no, I don't have an enemy in the world. I just have friends and employees. I say, friends and employees? What do you mean? I said, well, James 1, in the, in the Phillips letter of young churches, the old King James says, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation. The, new, the Phillips letter of young churches says, my brother, when all kinds of trials and temptations crowd into your life, don't resent them as intruders, welcome them as friends. So you got more friends than you thought you had. <laughs> See, so, uh, there's, so there's these trials, tests, and troubles are my friends. And then I say, then 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16 says that these light afflictions work for us. The light of the, when Paul says light afflictions, that must make ours feathers because he was beating, was striving, and all that. And so they work for us. So I read that one day, and the Lord says, What do light afflictions do? And I look and said, It says they work for us. I said, Oh, they're my employees. So when people come up to me and they say, you old bald-headed prophet, I don't believe you, I can't get it. I just reach in my billfold, take out some money and give it to them. They say, what are you doing that for? I said, I pay my employees well. They said, I'm not your employee. I said, oh, yes, you are. I tell you, you've just been helping produce long suffering and patience and mercy and forgiveness. You're just causing the fruit of the spirit to be, have to be growing in my life and you, you're just producing you're working hard in fact i'll change this from a 20 to a 50 because man you're really producing and if it wasn't that i knew that god was using you to develop the character of christ within me it'd be pow right in the antenna but i said 
I know you're just my employee working for me. And sometimes I'll use a husband and wife sitting on a front row and I'll take $20 and I'll say now to your wife, and now when he starts giving me that, 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 give me a bad time, just, just give him that 20. And he looks real strange and she reaches over and gives it to him. And then he wants to hand it back to me. Then I said, no, no, you keep it. You'll be giving it to her next week. <laughs> so in other words, that's the reason Paul says, rejoice several more in all things, give things. And one other main point that I bring out, that I've, I've read that scripture for 50, 60 years. By, I've been in the ministry 66 years. But years I've read it. Second Corinthians 12, 10 says this. Paul says, I take pleasure in. Now, I've asked people, give me a, what do you take pleasure in? They'll say, oh, sports, shopping, my children, praising the Lord, going to church. I say, but none of us ever, I've never had anybody put what do you take pleasure in, what, what Paul said. And Paul says, I take pleasure in infirmities, in persecution, in all these troubles and, and stresses and and I've, all these horrible things I'm going, I take pleasure in. I used to wonder, Paul, you either need a psychiatrist or you've got a revelation I don't have. I mean, how can you take pleasure in all these negative things? I mean, persecution, reproaches, necessities, needs, distressing things. And, and I finally realized when I wrote the, wrote the book, Paul, I understood Paul's greatest passion was to be like Jesus. Philippians, he said, oh, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection been made conformable to his death that I might be like him. Then he said, we're trans by the spirit of the Lord, we're transformed from glory to glory until we reach his image and likeness. And then verse 29 after 28 says, whom we did foreknow, he also did predestine to be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. And so the all things work to make us like Christ. All things make us to his character. So we have to go through some suffering, have to go through some troubles, have to go through some processes. I, um, I had a, bought a building in, I give, give you a high, in Arizona and paid a quarter million dollars for it and got, somebody gave me $50,000, put it down. My wife said, God's going to give you the building. And I put it up for $40,000 a month. I mean, $40,000 a year payment because a man, bless God, God sent 50000 in. I can pay 40000 a month, a year. And But that whole year I talked about it, only got 5000 in. And they gave me 60, 90 days extension. I worked and started doing everything I could, couldn't get it. I realized the scripture when God says, God opens doors that no man can shut. And God shuts doors that no man can open. And he shut the door. He, he wouldn't work. And I, then they gave me 30 more days. And finally, I had to sign all that property, all the money we'd put into it, back over to those people. And I lost it all. It was just devastating to me. I tell you, it affected, you know, I did, I did all the devil's work for him. I, I disowned myself. I condemned myself. I disqualified myself. You know, I, I just put myself through hell. And uh, the devil happened and out there. And for six months, God would not speak to me about it. Now, I'd go to the school of the Holy Spirit, prophesy to people, minister to people, preach. God would move through me, but not speak to me. After six months, I went walking one night, and God spoke to me and said, Bill Hammond, you're really upset about that money and, and the property, aren't you? I said, oh, yes, I lost it all. I lost it all. And God said, no, you didn't lose anything. I said, God, have you been on vacation for six months? I lost it all. It's gone. I mean, my friend gave me 50000 and then we put, we, 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 it's gone. He said, you know, you didn't really lose anything. I said, well, you would have to explain that one to me. He says, that was the tuition. I was willing to pay for your wisdom and maturity. He says, I can give you houses, lands, people overnight, but I cannot give you wisdom and maturity. And that was in 1979. And he said, I'm getting ready to release a revelation to you and anointing you that's going to cause you to reach the world. And you're going to have millions of people are going to be affected by what you say and do. And he says, I want to make sure you got the wisdom and maturity to have it. And three years later, in 82, God gave me the revelation of the company of prophets. And we started teaching and training about the company of prophets. And then it was birthed in 88 and uh, right on that line. And now we've got people uh, in every continent, almost every nation, teaching and training people in the prophetic. Now nobody believed in apostles and prophets in the 50s, 60s, but now everybody accepts apostles and prophets. In other words, all things work together to help me fulfill my destiny, which and, and my ministry, and but the highest is is calling in Christ Jesus. And that started when I was 22 years old. I'm 85 now. 
But that started when I was 22 years old. I was first, I was pastoring church, about 35 people. I came out of a Bible college that said, we young people are going to take the world. We're going to do it. Man, I came out ready to take the world. Got stuck in that church, about 25 people. They were singing, I shall not be, I shall not be moved. And I couldn't move them. I mean, but God put that pipsqueak prophet in there to, 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 for him to train him on. But in 22, I was fussing God. I said, God, I should be out preaching, praying, prophesying. I, and the world needs me. I need to be out there. And I said, Lord, I don't, don't have nobody's ever going to know me beyond this uh, Yakima Valley and my family. And he spoke, he said, Bill, how many? He said, let me tell you something. If you will learn to think my thoughts and be conformed to my character, nature, and my life, and, I, and you become the person I can trust as well as Father God trusted me, you, as far as I'm concerned, you'll be the most successful person on planet earth. And that started the seed. Now it's a fruit tree now, but it was just seed then. But God began to convince me that he's not concerned about me being the greatest. He's concerned about me being like Christ Jesus. And whatever it takes, if, if, if you make a commitment, or when you accepted the blood of Jesus, he bought us body, soul, and spirit. And we signed the bottom of the contract and left the blanks open. And he's filling it in now. <laughs> and all things do work together for good to we who love God and are called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestine to be conformed to the image of his son, that Jesus might be the firstborn among many families just like him. So I, I try to encourage people, all things work together for good. And now how could Paul say rejoice evermore in all things give thanks, but when he said it's all working? And if you were, I said, can you believe Romans 8, 28, 29, and 2 Corinthians 3, 18 is as true as John 3, 16? That is, and, and I'm sure, John, in your life, you've gone through at least one or two heartbreaking, mind-blowing, world-shaking situations. Oh, God, you know, shut, shut all the windows, honey, turn the gas on, goodbye, old world, goodbye. Everybody I've ever talked to is going through some of them, but they work to kill us. And I tell people, God's out to kill you so he can live in you. You might as well go ahead and die and get it over with. Like Paul says in Romans 6 to 11, consider yourself dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. So I want to encourage all the people that's listening. Might God encourage you. I mean, if you can get this truth, this book will keep you from getting discouraged. And I've seen in my 66 years of ministry, I've seen several ministers backslide, leave them because God didn't back them up. They went out on a limb and said, "Yo, oh, I'm going to believe and God's got to back me. And God said, I back my word, not your reputation and not your personality or not your doings. And so, but when you realize all of it's working and, and I went through, I went, I, I just told you a few things. I went through this heartbreaking, mind-blowing, world-shaking situation, but three, two times in a ministry at a time, I had to go out of pulpit ministry and work in the world because of some people's uh, attitudes and actions toward me and what they did. But, you know, I find it all has been for my benefit. It's all working together for our good. And if you can see that, it takes the pressure out of being, uh, being a man of failure or why God. And, and, and I say, nobody will be in a ruined reigning class is still questioning God. Because you've got to have absolute trust in God. He's absolutely righteous. He's absolutely true. He does nothing but what is best for us. And even though we feel like we're going through hell, and I tell everybody, when you're going through hell, don't stop going through. And like I said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. But if you stop and sit down and start contemplating what you're going through, you will get discouraged. And, and I want to help those that are going through it. If, you, if you've committed your life to Christ as a person has, and said, Lord, I want to be like you, then you've already signed the bottom of the contract, and he's got the right. He owns you. He can get whatever it takes. And by the way, I used to pray, oh, God, take old square of me, drag me through your round knot hole, and I'll make, if I if scream, ball and squall, and I'll make three-inch grooves in the cement, take me on through anyhow. Man, if you want a prayer answered fast, just pray that prayer. He jumps <laughs> out of the And I'm He's chucked me through, and I've screamed and yelled and cried and why I got up. But it's been the making, and I can I can say it's worth it all. And that's really about what Paul says in Romans 8, after he says we're children of God, heirs of God, and if so be that we suffer with him. Then he says, verse 18, for I consider the sufferings of this present life not worthy to be compared with the glory. Glory equals Christ's likeness that shall be revealed in us. If I am conformed to the likeness of Christ and think like he thinks, have his conviction, have his vision, have his heart, have his mind, 
the, the, the glory and the blessings of being a joint heir and a co-laborer with Christ throughout eternity. If I had to be beaten every day, it couldn't be compared to it. There's nothing you can go through in this life that's not worthy of going through for what you can gain by being conformed to the likeness of Christ. Because the only ones who are going to rule and reign with Christ are those who come to conform to Christ and are overcomers. So I would like to encourage people. I don't know whether you are able to distribute anything, books like that. But if they have gone through some things, like to know the answer, like to come to the place that from here on out, they never say why again. Say, Lord, now my will with thine be done. And it's like, Jesus, you'll go through a few of those, Father, if it be possible. But nevertheless, not my will with thine be done. Oh, I feel like I just got a mini sermon, Bill. Thank you for that. Amen. Um, it's almost time for us to wrap up. But, Bill, I'd love for you to pray for our viewers, pray for the listeners, and then, and then we'll wrap up. Okay. Father God, right now, you got people out there, Lord, that you have been training them, you've been working with them, and they've, they've gone through bankruptcy, they've gone through divorce, they've gone through all kind of heartbreak and mind blowing, even maybe death of a loved one, a child, God, but regardless what they've gone through, if they love you and according to your purpose, it has to work to make them more like Christ Jesus. So Lord, let this spirit of wisdom and revelation rest upon each one, that they will get this revelation and know that God loves them. Everything he does is for their good. And I had to come to that place, Lord. I went through many a test, many a trouble. Let me tell you, after 66 years of being in the ministry, 70 years being a Christian, I can tell you it's worth it all. I've gone through as much as anybody I've ever talked to, except some in the foreign countries that's put in jail and beaten every day, but I've gone through enough that I know that Paul was right, that all things do work together to make me like Christ Jesus, and I can take pleasure in the things that task prior in my life, because God, that's nothing happened to me, but what it makes me more like Christ, and I want to come to that state, and I know you want to come to that stage where God could trust you as much as God, Father God trusted Jesus. Lord, do that now. Spirit of wisdom revelation, hit them right now, activate right now, and may they never get Get discouraged to the place they'll get ready to give up, but let them know God's in control and God's conforming them, and He's bringing a law of transformation, is bringing them to Christ likeness. And for be a million, billion years, they'll be thankful they allowed God to take them through to become who they are today. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 And Bill, if people want to find out more about the book, find out more about the ministry, where can they find you on the web? We're ChristianInternational.com. All right. And then it's got all the yep. books there and everything. ChristianInternational.com. And these books are in all the bookstores now. Yes. And all, uh, my, all my books except this and will soon be are in Spanish. So people want the Spanish version, all of them's in Spanish. Well, and uh, like like we do with every episode, we'll include detailed links in the show notes, places where you can connect with Christian International. And as Bill said, his books are available pretty much anywhere books are sold. So we'll have links to where you can pick up a copy of Your Greatest Calling as well. Uh, it's time to bring this episode of the Sean Tabot Show to a close. Many thanks for being a part of my conversation with Bishop Bill Hammond. Once again, our book today was Your Highest Calling, Discover the Secret Processes that Fulfill Your Destiny. Uh, for more on Bishop Hammond and the book, a great place to start is the Christian International website. Once again, you can find that over at christianinternational.com. And Bishop Hammond, I just want to say thanks so much for sharing with us today. It's been a great pleasure and an honor to have you back in the show. Sean, bless you much, man. You're doing a good work. Keep it up.